Hello everybody, welcome to The Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today is a Patreon request from AMJ. I am talking about the 2011 debut album from Filter, The Beautiful Lies. Filter is the alias for Norwegian producer Magnus Jurgensen, sorry for butcher pronunciations, uh, best known for his uh, particularly soundtrack-ready sound and style that combines electronic elements with a lot of cinematic orchestral elements. No actual orchestras just sound like VSTs, but they are good-sounding VSTs that are commonly used in that kind of soundtrack setting nowadays. The kind of sounds you'd hear on, like, a C418 album, for instance. I had obviously never heard of this guy before the request was sent in, though the guy who requested this considers Filter to be one of his favorite artists of all time, and he apparently had a particularly hard time deciding which specific album from this guy he most wanted me to cover or thought would make the best impression on me, even if this debut project here seemed to be the one he stuck by the most. I looked up the guy's catalog myself and saw he only had four other albums aside from this one, so I told the requester, hey, if you're so stuck on this one, I can give the other projects a listen like I did when I did the Sea Feel video and give some quick thoughts on his other stuff. After hearing those other albums, I can kind of see where the requester's indecision may have come from, because this guy's albums are basically all exactly the same. Okay, that's not completely fair. There, there are subtle differences between each album sounds and approaches. Uh, but I will have to say, a lot of this stuff kinda ran together for me, and the further along chronologically I got into his catalog, the less and less impressed I was by what I was hearing. His sophomore album, The Blossom Chronicles, in 2012 did have some slight melodic dubstep edges in a number of moments that reminded me of Black Mill. I thought that was pretty cool. But there were also these kinda corny spoken word passages and some other vocal guests delivering some particularly hokey and on-the-nose lyrics going into all these cliches about adventure stories and whatnot that I wasn't feeling. Also, one act Actively terrible track called We Fought Monsters, which I could not take seriously at all. In 2014, he composed a soundtrack album to a shelved indie game called The Legend of Ea, and uh, maybe if we ever got to experience this stuff in the context of that game, it probably would have hit better, but as an out of context album, it mostly just blended in the background for me. Didn't really deliver that much, it stuck out to me one way or the other beyond being pleasant enough orchestral tinged, like kinda Zelda inspired soundtrack material. Also, at 70 minutes with most of these tracks hitting on a very similar general tone and mood, it did kind of start to drag on. In 2016, we got the Campfire Tales, which started introducing some trendier trap elements I wasn't too fond of, and the arrangements started to feel honestly kind of more soulless and corporate, like I was listening to demo songs that come prepackaged with royalty-free sample packs. The orchestral parts were still nice, but there was absolutely nothing here that wasn't done better previously on an older album of his, and the formula was kind of starting to grow stale for me. And in 2019, we got The Queen of Crows, which was basically the exact same thing, but even worse. Uh, leaning a lot more into kaigo Tropical House and more trap beats and corny vocal guests, watering down the guy's original appeal enough to start tipping into actively bad territory for me. And oh my fucking god, that one white guy rapper that showed up here and on the previous episode, album, Johnny October. That guy was nuclear levels of cringe. Every single second I was listening to the sound of that guy's voice and his inspirational lyrics about wishing on a star or whatever, I wanted to fucking die. Oh, look, like all of Filter's music is trying to sound super sentimental and emotional and evoke grand open space with all these big orchestral flourishes. But while the formula may have worked at first, all the attempts at evoking that same feeling over and over uh, kind of felt increasingly cheap and shallow with each passing album, and like he didn't really have the substance to back himself up. Those later albums often feel like they were just specifically designed to be picked up by the Spotify algorithm for people to just listen to in the background uh, with, while doing something else without much to engage with beyond the surface level. The orchestral blend, especially on those later albums, had such an over-generic commercial slant and a sense of kind of rotely going through the motions that Spotify's ad placements could start to sound like they were just part of the album, and that's not a good sign. I also found it telling that when I finished listening to one of these albums, Spotify immediately started auto-playing Lindsey Sterling, which I was so caught off guard in that moment by how perfect a match that ended up being that I burst out laughing. Lindsay Sterling's music always felt to me like the kind of thing where the fact that she played violin over EDM instrumentals was kind of treated like a shallow gimmick, like it was banking on your being impressed just by the fact that it combined EDM beats and violin alone. And once you got past that novelty and take her songs for what they were, 
her stuff could get tedious really fast and even start to make me sick of hearing violins. These two artists definitely have their separate strengths and weaknesses. Filter's catalog has both significantly higher highs and lower lows, where Sterling's catalog mostly sits around the same level of eh for me, but I think I ended up enjoying both artists' full catalogs on a similar level of depth. Man, I was not expecting this video to get so negative. Apologies to the guy who requested this. If Filter's uh, stuff really moved him on that deeper level, I do get it. I don't want to take that away from him. He just, I don't know, didn't really move me as much as I think uh, the requester was hoping. At least on the bright side, the album I'm actually supposed to review today, The Beautiful Lies, doesn't have all these issues present to even close to the same degree. It's his best album, without question. There was a part of me who wondered whether the fact that I heard this one first before the other albums kind of more wore his formula into the ground contributed to uh, my more positive feelings on this one, but even going back to listen to it after having been disappointed by his most recent work, it pretty much immediately clicked with me again, despite the sound not being too far away. Not to say I think this album is exactly a masterpiece either, I only think it's pretty good, if nothing outstanding. But at the very least, I feel like this album did the best job of establishing a somewhat unique style and identity for Filter that he could call his own, blending the orchestral VSTs that would color all his other work and end up as his primary selling point, with a bunch of chiptune influences and even some mild post-rock influences that actually did a bit more to set himself apart from the crowd. Also, I think this album probably had his strongest tunes and arrangements just, like, on a musical and songwriting front. The album definitely gets off to a strong start with the opener, the protagonist, blending music box melodies with usual string washes and some Asian woodwinds and a semi-organic swung beat stomping underneath. Definitely does well to set the tone for the whole magical adventure feel that all of Filter's music goes for. There's a bunch of strong instrumental cuts all together right in that opening stretch, too. You got, like, for instance, 8-Bit Smiles, which lives up to its title, uh, primarily building itself around old-school chiptune synth melodies and NES Mario sound effects. Maybe the kind of thing that would have had more novelty value back in 2011 than it does listening to it in 2024 when there's absolutely nothing cool or special about a track like this referencing Super Mario Bros. Once falling in reverse touched the idea, it may as well have been killed off forever, but this track absolutely has a strong enough tune and melody to back itself up and raise it above being a mere novelty. Heck, it probably just straight up had my single favorite melody on the album. Beyond that, I like how the tracks 25 and 26 kind of trade off ideas, uh, the former bringing in some warm but melancholy piano and string melodies and putting them over a UK garage type beat with some cool little vocal chops and breakbeat snippets on the side, and the latter spinning the same tune and chord progression into a new arrangement that gives the beats a little more of like a halftime dubstep influence pattern, and also leans more into the chiptune elements again. There's a track called Doomsday Device, which doesn't remotely come close to matching the mood promised by that title, but is still very nice and pleasant, with its marimba melodies and various woodwinds doing more to feel like some kind of peaceful jungle village theme for a Zelda game again. <laughs> and if you wanted something that actually did have a bit more urgency to match its title, you got Paris on Fire. Uh, the really somber minor key chord progressions being delivered through all these blaring trumpets and horns uh, definitely may at least make it feel like something dangerous and tragic is going on here. I also have to say, this album is also notable for being the only Filter album in which the tracks with guest vocal appearances and full lyrics were highlights and not skips for me. I have nothing against Miriam Vaga as a singer. Uh, the sound of her voice and delivery is really nice on all her appearances on Filter albums. Usually it's the cliched or hokey lyrics that did more to undercut her presence on later projects, like store shelf generic metaphors about running with wolves, or trying to tell a story about some girl named Blossom that doesn't actually tell any kind of story. Not that the lyrics on this album, such as I pulled a gun at the world today, are exactly the height of poetry either, but at least they're never so on the nose to be outright distracting or actively get in the way of the experience. Revolver is also by a long shot the catchiest tune out of any track I've heard from Filter. Uh, the whistling melodies in some parts had the potential to make this track feel like an ad jingle, but the way they go up against the guitar strumming and more energetic, organic beatwork gives the whole track a kind of quirky but heartfelt energy similar to something like Rusted Roots Send Me On My Way. I can definitely fuck with it. 
The other vocal track, Haunting, isn't nearly as much of an easily memorable earworm, but I do really like the way that track kinda has these post-rocky drops with lead chiptune melodies kinda acting in the way of choruses. That was definitely a solid track as well. All of this is definitely really nice, though I will have to say once we get into the second half of the album, my enthusiasm gradually starts to wane a bit as we get more tracks that don't really stand out to me as much. Tracks like Blue Eyes and Gathering of Machines are enjoyable enough and decently hit upon the emotional notes they're trying to hit on through their typically sentimental string washes and nice wordless vocals adding extra texture, presumably from Miriam Vaga again. But they don't really, like, introduce any new ideas that other previous tracks didn't touch on before or do better. And there are also two particularly weak and forgettable cuts near the end in Air and Electric Heart. Uh, the former just sounds like the exact average of all the most downbeat parts of this album without anything really special to note about it, and the latter is kind of like a generic Paco Bell's canon adjacent chord progression that I think was trying to hit on this really triumphant and sentimental note of relief, but mostly just came off kind of cheesy to me. Though things are pulled together more for the ending in The Antagonist, delivering a few jazz-influenced beats and strings over its particularly simple broken piano chords and eventually hitting some epic post-rock climaxes, is not a massive favorite or among the strongest of tunes this album has to offer, but it is a suitably satisfying way for the album to finish. And uh, yeah, that's about all I have to say on The Beautiful Eyes. It's good. Not incredible, but it's good. I can see why this stuff did work as well as it does for the guy who requested this. It is definitely trying its absolute hardest to hit on that deeper emotional level and get there with some decently varied organic textures. I can definitely respect all of it. At the same time, I've also definitely heard better stuff in this vein. Uh, the most obvious comparison point that came to my mind is definitely Zircon. That's an artist whose sound brings together very similar influences from various 90s dance music legends to other organic and occasional orchestral flourishes and even influences from video game soundtracks as well as actual video game soundtracks. But he is significantly more versatile in terms of the kinds of moods and styles he's able to capture. Uh, make sure you've heard Identity Sequence, Anti-Gravity, and The Fittest soundtrack. I can also hear Filter taking a lot of obvious cues in the way he writes his melodies and chord progressions from the much more well-known fellow Norwegian outfit Roiksop. Albums of theirs like The Understanding and especially Junior probably made a big impact on him, and their most recent Profound Mysteries trilogy also hits upon a lot of similar vibes to Filter, with their with more of their trademark dance pop edge. I already brought up C418 as a comparison point, but that guy's stuff uh, especially is heard on like the Minecraft soundtrack, and albums like One can definitely hit on a very similar note that uh, can sometimes even feel like it's going even deeper despite his arrangements often being much more simplistic and ambient-centric. If you're looking for some of the, like, the heartfelt melodic dubstep sound, you'll want to check out Black Mill's Miracle. Uh, in terms of quirkier down-tempo, that brings in all sorts of weird instrumental flares like this, but still has that clear heart behind it. Check out Spunkshine, and especially his recent album, A Memory of Something Vast and Elemental. If you're looking for the sentimental post-rock crossing over with more electronic arrangements like these, check out Future Loop Foundation's Memories from a Fading Room. That one's always hit me personally on a deeper emotional level than even a lot of the other comparison points I've just made. I even just got done reviewing an electronic orchestral hybrid album from Ethereal Bonds, which I liked more than this, even if that one has a significantly darker tone. I could go on. Hearing Filter for the first time in 2024, while so many other similar artists have been in my life for much longer and left that much more of an impact on me, did significantly limit how much this stuff could get to me. But at the same time, I can easily imagine an alternate universe where I'd come across this guy's music in high school around the same time as I'd first heard a bunch of these artists through recommendations from Pandora Radio. It was certainly possible for him to have come up in those playlists in that specific era of my life when I was using Pandora for recommendations, and maybe if he'd showed up at the right time, I'd be talking about this album in a similar breath to those kinds of artists. Or it's possible he could have turned out like an artist such as Deadly Avenger, who I got like one album wreck I really liked from that Pandora shuffle, but not so much to convince me to look into him deeper, and I kind of forgot existed until I was thinking about this era of my life. Honestly, it's entirely possible that Filter did come up as a Pandora recommendation back then, and I just didn't take enough notice. At the end of the day, even if this is not a shining example of the absolute best any of these genres have to offer, and it might not mean as much to me as an adult as it might have if I'd heard this as a teenager, it still works quite well for everything it's going for. I can see why the requester loved it as much as he did. And, hey, if you're a fan of any of those artists I've compared this to, maybe it'll be worth checking out. And in any case, 
I think it's good. I'm, I'm overall feeling like a, a 7.3 out of 10 on this album. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters. They're awesome people. You want to add yourself that list? Link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.